بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد we have almost completed the treaties نواخذ الإسلام by شيخ الإسلام محمد بن عبد الوهاب رحمه الله تعالى and we've reached the tenth ناقذ من نواخذ الإسلام that he mentioned رحمه الله تعالى and بإذن الله this will be the final درس in this uh, the final lesson in this series بإذن الله تعالى and we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us with tawfiq and blesses us with, a, with uh, ikhlas with thabat ala sunnah sunnah al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam قال الشيخ محمد بن عبد الوهاب رحمه الله تعالى قال العشر الإعراض عن دين الله تعالى لا يعلمه ولا يعمل به ودليل قوله تعالى ومن أظلم مما ذكر بآيات ربه ثم أعرض عنها إن من المجرمين منتقمون ولا فرق في جميع هذه النواقض بين الهزل والجاد والخائف إلا مكره وكلها من أعظم ما يكون خطرا ومن أكثر ما يكون وقوعا فين فينبغي للمسلم أن يهذرها ويخاف منها على نفسه نعوذ بالله من موجبات غضبه وأليم عقابه. So Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah Taala said, he said the tenth nullifier, anyone who turns completely away from the religion of Allah, neglecting the tenets of faith, or not practicing them, has disbelieved. The evidence for this is the saying of the Almighty, and who does more wrong than he who is reminded of the verses of his Lord? Then he turns away therefrom. Verily we will extract retribution from the mujrimun those uh, disbelievers, those criminals, those wicked sinners. And this is verse uh, Suratul Sajda, uh, verse 22. Neglecting something from the religion uh, is of two types. The first type is the total disregard, which expels the perpetrator from the religion. So when someone totally disregards Islam, you know, learning anything about their religion, they just say, yeah, I'm a Muslim, that's it. It's just my name, you know, that's my, my tribe uh, that I, I was born into and my nation I was born into was a Muslim people and that's sufficient as being a Muslim. The one who totally disregards uh, expels the perpetrator from the religion which entails neglecting the commandments of Islam. So this means this person doesn't strive to learn anything about Islam and they neglect totally what is uh, the obligatory duties upon them. The woman, she says, I don't have to pray, I don't have to cover, it's in my heart, Iman. All this, uh, these other kind of um, deviant beliefs. Deviant, why? Because they go against Orthodox Islam, they go against Islam. They go against the Islamic creed and the belief and what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with. So this entails neglecting the commandments of Islam which is a condition of sound faith because as we mentioned before Iman is comprised of uh, outward actions, the actions of the uh, the limbs the actions of the tongue you know by uttering the shahada and, and say, saying a good word or, or, or what have you and the actions of the heart meaning the, the heart itself has has activity. As a Muslim, we believe the heart, in essence, you could say, has actions. That it, uh, for example, tawakkul, you know, tawakkul ala Allah, you know, relying on Allah, putting your trust in Allah, that's an action of the heart. That's something that entails your heart. Uh, putting, uh, and, and the various types of, of uh, faith and action that deals with the ibadat qalbiyah, you know, those actions which are in the heart that in, entail worship. Also, neglecting obligatory knowledge that is required to practice Islam, 
expels one from the fold of Islam. And this is a statement, actually all of that was a statement from, uh, was a statement taken from one of the Talabat al-Ilm, may Allah preserve her. A person who does this is, disregard, is disregarding the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we neglect what Allah has, uh, has imposed upon us as, as duties, our obligatory duties, those things which we must do uh, as believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill and to show our thankfulness to Allah and our gratefulness to Him and to fulfill our duty of worship to Him. A person who uh, neglects this is disregarding the commandments of Allah and His Messenger In addition, it is imperative to understand that faith is comprised of, as we mentioned, belief and actions in the heart, physical actions, and what is articulated through speech. The Prophet wasallam said, Whoever amongst you witnesses evil, then change it with his hand, and if you are unable to do so, with his speech, and if you are unable to do so, then with his heart, and that is the weakest of iman. So the Prophet wasallam in that hadith, he mentioned that that was, all, that was iman. He said that is the weakest part of iman, when a person hates an evil action in their heart and they don't do anything to change it except for they dislike it in their heart that's a part of Iman and as the Prophet Sallallahu it's the weakest of Iman so that's Dalil that's evidence that all of that is a part of Iman what? Iman is comprised of actions on the limbs actions of the uh, on the tongue meaning speaking and articulating uh, righteous speech or commanding the good and forbidding the evil by your tongue and also iman has to do with the heart as well all of those things are a part of iman the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said or we mentioned the hadith the hadith of uh, abdullah bin mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu who said sami'tu rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam yaqul من راى منكم منكرا فليغيره بيد فان لم يستطع فبلسانه فان لم يستطع فبقلبه وذلك عدو في الايمان رواه مسلم it's a hadith of muslim and that's a hadith we just mentioned where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam let us know that iman alayhi salatu wasalam uh, that that of course commanding the good and forbidding the evil is a part of iman and that those that articulates the various parts of iman that it entails again actions of the hand, uh, you know doing physical outward actions and good deeds by doing uh, speaking a kind word or uh, enjoining the good or forbidding evil by speaking against something harm harmful or speaking against bid'ah or speaking against Ahl bid'ah for their going against the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the last part as we mentioned actions of the heart actions of the heart and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said وَذَلَكَ عَذَفُ الْإِيمَانِ and that's the weakest of Iman that's the weakest of faith the second way in which a person shows total disregard from the religion is by neglecting knowledge that is required to practice Islam properly so how can you practice Islam if you don't know uh, how to practice Islam. That comes from ilm, it comes from knowledge, it comes from uh, ta'lim, it comes from studying. There's no way you're just going to meditate and understand all the, the concepts of Islam. Or you're going to sit in your home and totally disregard the, the duties of Islam and then you're going to be, it's going to be revealed to you. Revelation stopped with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's imperative that we know that we have to seek knowledge. That we have to uh, that we have to have a certain level of knowledge in order to strengthen our iman and in order to practice Islam in general. How do you know how? How do you know how to to pray? We know how to pray by studying the prayer. The prayer is not something you could have come across to learn how to pray the Islamic prayer to pray properly as a Muslim. You could not have possibly discover that without going to the Nasus, without going to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and studying from those people who, uh, the, the, the ulama and the, the scholars and the Talabat al-ilm and the du'at and those people who could have taught you. You had to learn those things. Those are things we had to learn. And they come from the Nasus. So 
uh, that comes from seeking at least that level of knowledge to know how to practice what is in obligation upon you. Uh, for example, the one who does not have correct knowledge of Tawheed, for example, monotheism, and refuses to educate themselves uh, regarding this issue, which is the foundation of Islam, by avoiding study circles with the scholars or students of knowledge, or even neglecting to read about Tawheed, then this person has failed to meet this obligation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Know that he alone is worthy of worship and seek forgiveness for your sins. And that's uh, Surah Al-Muhammad, Surah al Muhammad uh, verse 19 also neglecting to seek knowledge regarding prayer and purification as we mentioned which are obligations upon every Muslim uh, is also considered disbelief because if you don't know how to pray you don't know how to make tahara then you, that's a shart that is a shart from the shurut shurut salat that tahara purification is a condition for amongst the various conditions that one needs to fulfill in order to pray. In order to pray as a Muslim, we believe and we uh, follow the example of the Prophet ﷺ that we have to have purification. We have to purify ourselves and prepare ourselves for the prayer by cleaning ourselves, by making the wudu, making, washing our limbs, washing our uh, all the things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded in the Quran to wash. And what the Prophet ﷺ illustrated for us in his sunnah alayhi salatu wasalam, on how we need to perform the prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, or, uh, also, or Allah ta'ala says, and it is not proper for the believers to go out and fight altogether. Of every troop of them, a party only should go forth. That they who are left behind may get instructions in Islamic religion and that they may warn their people when they return to them so that they may beware of evil. So that shows us that even in the situation of jihad, that it is proper, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that a party from amongst the believers should stay, stay back to teach. So that shows us the fadilat al-ilm, the, the benefits of knowledge, that we need someone always to be uh, educating the community that we need that. that. That is imperative in order to seek knowledge and to know the obligatory duties because when you lose that, uh, that light of knowledge in your community, then the community remains stagnant. Knowledge brings about new... Uh, it brings about... It revives the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. It uh, encourages us to do the obligatory duties and the, the extra duties, the extra duties that we can receive reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it teaches us our, as we mentioned, our obligation, that you have to know certain things. You have to know who Allah is and how to worship Him properly. As Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab said in his other treaties in the Sulu Thalatha, he began it, what he said, اعلم رحمك الله أنه يجب علينا تعلم أربع مسائل الأولى العلم وهو معروفة الله معروفة النبي معروفة دين الإسلام بيدلة. He said, he said, no, and may Allah have mercy upon you. So he started his treaties by uh, seeking mercy for those people who read and studied to open up their heart to this very beneficial knowledge. He said, it's an obligation to study four, four issues. He said, the first thing is knowledge. The first thing is knowledge. Alula al ilm wa huwa ma'rufat Allah. He said, and it's knowing Allah. Wa ma'rufat Nabi. And knowing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ma'rufat the deen al Islam bi adilla. And knowing Islam with the textual proofs. Not knowing it just according to your madhab or knowing it because your shaykh told you so. Our deen is not made up of fatawa. Fatawa, they help us to practice our religion. But the foundation is not the fatawa. The foundation is what? As we mentioned before, it's kitabillah. وَسُنَّةُ رَسُولُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِنَّ الْإِجْمَاعَ of the ulama, ijma sahaba, they're the first ulama and the first of ahl ilm, and the the best of ahl ilm is the sahaba to Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, radiyallahu taala anhu majmain. That's the asas of our foundation. So that's why it's imperative, and this is also this brings to point something uh, that we have to be concerned about that we've seen in many of our communities, in in Salafi communities, and other, of course, min baba ola, and other than Salafi communities. If we claim to seek knowledge, we we love to talk about knowledge in our community. Community. But we need real tarbiyah. We need to raise the standard 
of knowledge in our community by having du'at that are grounded and that can teach the people. That having talabat al-ilm that are grounded, that can teach the people and hopefully in the future to have mashayikh from amongst our people who know the situation and can deal with the issues that we deal with, for example, in North America or that we deal with in the UK or we deal with in Australia or we deal with wherever, in Japan, wherever it is. That you need people, uh, uh, ulama, from those, those countries as well. That's very important. The point is what that we see as a taqseer from some of our brothers and sisters who are not students of knowledge that they maybe they depend totally on websites and they possibly may read some books, maybe. The problem is, is a lot of times they cut and paste their whole religion based on fatawa. Sheikh so-and-so said, Sheikh so-and-so said, and that's beautiful. Those are our ulama. We love, especially if it's coming from the ulama of Ahl Sunnah. That's imperative. But that is not how you establish the foundation of your religion. There's no way you can build your foundation by fatawa. Fatawa, they give you those umur uh, ijtihadiyah uh, and, and, and so forth. But the nusus, it's, it's there in the nusus. It's there in the halaqat al-ilm with the ulama by sitting with them and finishing matun. This is the importance of why I wanted to actually finish this book and do some matun instead of just giving little internet sound bites that sometimes make you feel good and, and they, they are beneficial that they give you some iman. But we also need to begin to have the kind of tarbiyah that we finish matun of the salaf and, and the ulama uh, that came after them, the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, that we need that we need that kind of tarbiyah otherwise we leave the people to be at the whims of whoever gives them the next fatawa whoever tells them this is halal and this one is haram and they have no assess they have no tools in order to distinguish between right and wrong so that shows us what the importance of knowledge and the importance of knowing the obligatory knowledge that we shouldn't be always uh, you know years and years and years into our religion uh, uh, you know as a convert or as someone who uh, was born a Muslim that we're still you know we're supposedly studying or we're maybe not studying but we're still asking questions uh, basic issues you know can I use uh, you know can I use rainwater for uh, for wudu oh I was in the sea can I use the seawater there's salt in it uh, is that pure or not we shouldn't be asking these questions if we're doing at least the basic studies of our religion so that we know uh, what we can do and what we can't. How to make tahara, how to make salat, and how to pay the zakat if it's obligatory upon us, and if we're ahlin for that, and, and so forth. We need to know those legislations according to Kitab Allah wa Sunnatul Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the second type of neglect, so that was the first type. The, the first type of neglect in the religion is in total disregard. The second type is the partial neglect, uh, is neglecting partially. And that is, which that does not constitute constitute disbelief and it is disregarding an obligatory action from the Sharia so whoever neglects something from the religion that is not related to disbelief and there is no text to support it being kufr then this does not constitute disbelief so uh, if there's no text no textual evidence to show that someone is neglecting something from the religion and there's no evidence to show that this by neglecting this that the person is a disbeliever for example then of course they don't the, the ulama don't rule that this is uh, the, this, this does not it doesn't constitute uh, disbelief for example the one who disregards the responsibility of serving his parents okay although this constitutes a major sin it does not entail disbelief, nor does the one who neglects his parents become a disbeliever. So you don't become a disbeliever by that sin. But however, it's a major sin. It's something absolutely, uh, 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 it's a terrible sin, and it's abhorrent, and, but it does not negate a person's iman in totality. In addition, those who fail to remember Allah and practice His religion also can fall into disbelief if they neglect these forms of worships uh, of worship in totality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and whoever turns away from the reminder of his Lord, meaning the Quran and practicing His commandments, He will cause him to enter in a, uh, into severe torment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also warns that whoever, but whoever turns away from my reminder, verily for him is a life of hardship. And we shall raise him up 
blind on the day of resurrection. He will say, Oh my Lord, why have you raised me up blind while I had sight before? Allah will say, Like like this our verses came unto you, but you disregarded them. So this day you will be neglected. Wa billah, and that's Surah Taha, uh, verses 124 to 126. That shows us, that illustrates the seriousness of reflecting upon the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran, and the signs and warnings Allah shows us in this life and in His creation, and the importance of practicing what we know from the religion. So practice what you preach. Learn uh, the religion. Learn the wajib. Ya yu aladina amanu lima lima tukuluna lama lima tukuluna mala ta mala ya yu aladina amanu. Allah subhanahu wa taala says in surah to surah to saf. Ya yu aladina amanu. O you who believe. Why do you say that which you do not that which you do not do? And that this is a major, major sin with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kabra maktan in Dullahi and Tukuluna Mala Ta'alamun. And it's a major sin, a major uh, infraction that a person says that which they do not do. They don't practice what they preach. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this all throughout the Quran, warned us of the importance of practicing and to reflect upon his, his verses and signs. Shaykh Abdulaziz uh, al states, the neglect that expels one from Islam is of three types. Carelessness by not believing and not disbelieving in the message of, uh, of Islam. Also neglecting the foundation of the religion. Neglecting to perform actions by not performing any Islamic duties. This one declares the testimony of faith and that's it. He lives his entire life without doing anything from righteous deeds and he is capable of performing them. This is disbelief by consensus of Ahl Sunnah as Salafi'een. So the Shaykh mentioned that when a person neglects something from the foundation of the religion, and obligatory, obligatory actions and performing them. Even if they say the shahada, but they leave off everything else, then and they spend their whole entire life busying themselves with that which is other than that, then this is uh, disbelief. They're not doing anything from righteous deeds. They just believe that it's sufficient. And this is the creed of the murjia. This is the creed of the sect in Islam, an early sect, who believed that Iman was constant. And they believe that actions were not a part of Iman. So that is imperative that we avoid that creed and that creed, the effects of that creed. Sometimes in some people it's khalis, meaning they're totally murjia. And some people they're affected. Many uh, of our brothers and sisters unfortunately are infected by that creed. That they just say, hey, I mean how many times have we heard our, our sisters in Islam who say, I don't have to cover. She's wearing a mini skirt, she's wearing tight jeans, uh, she's wearing this and that and the other or less than that. And she says, Iman is in my heart, brother, you don't know my heart, don't judge me. Okay, yes, you're right, I don't know uh, the extent of Iman, but there's no doubt we have cause to judge because Ahl Sunnah judges Allah Zahir, Yahkam Allah Zahir. Ahl Sunnah, they look at what's apparent because Allah has given us authority according to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam to make judgments. That's why we have Islamic judges, that's why we have an Islamic state, that's why we have that people uh, for infractions in Islam, for, for sins that require those, those punishments that they are uh, mentioned in the Quran or mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. So we have to judge. We have to judge. We have to know uh, when uh, someone is a person of righteousness in order for, to see if they're suitable for marriage. We have to know if they're a person who is a person of righteousness or they're a person of sinfulness or bid'ah or what have you that we know how to interact with them. Can we take their testimony? Are they a reliable person? Is their khabar, is, is their, uh, their statements, are their statements reliable? All of these things, the, they, they are, those reliability tests, they come from knowing the status of that individual. So we are, uh, Islam teaches us from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam and the Faham and the Salaf al-Saleh, radiallahu ta'ala majma'een, that we learn that we have to know 
the status of individuals, our brothers and sisters, to know whether they're trustworthy or not. That's imperative. It doesn't mean we go around spying and we do this and we do that. No, but you have to have an idea about who you're dealing with, and especially when someone comes to you with news, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear in Surah Al-Hujarat, that if a facet comes to you, then, then, then uh, uh, you know, make, uh, clarify or find out whether they're speaking, what, what they're speaking, if it's true or not. That you don't just take every khabar that you hear, everything you hear about an individual, or everything you hear about a group of individuals, or what have you. You don't take it all just like that. You have to know if the person who's transmitting that 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 uh, that news or what have you, or those statements, that they are a person who are trustworthy. Some uh, other things which prove this point is the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam In the body there is an organ and if it is pure then the whole body is pure and if it is impure then the whole body is impure Verily it is the heart Allah wa hiya qalb as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Shaykh Abd, uh, Abdul Aziz explains if in the heart there is hope, uh, there is fear and hope and love, and a person lives a long time without anything that prohibits his expressing his faith by doing deeds, then for sure there will be a positive effect upon his actions according to the level of faith in his heart, or else the heart will become void of fear, hope, and love, and a heart void of the actions of the heart is the heart of a disbeliever and this is by consensus so that shows us it's imperative that we have to do actions of the heart we have to have that iman in our heart and on our actions that there's a relationship as the Prophet Sallallahu said that in the Fijizid Mudghatan Fa'idha Salaha Salaha Jizid Akullu Fi'idha Fasada Fasada Jizid Akullu Allah Wahi Al-Qalb The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Verily in the body there's a morsel of flesh and if it is healthy then the rest of the body is healthy and if it is sick then the whole body is sick and verily it's the heart so meaning if our heart is sick it'll be reflected in our actions you can see when we see that even um, when we look at individuals in, in general when you see somebody you can tell a lot of times when a person many times you can tell if they're a, a person who's a depressed individual or they're a person who's going through a lot of struggle and anxiety in their life. They have, they're stressed out. You can see that from their outward appearance. Their heart is stressed, so then their actions, they illustrate stress in their work, in the way they deal with people. They have short tempers. They have poor manners, maybe. Or they're withdrawn all the time. This is a sign of depression. What is that as a sign of? That's a sign of actions that, that something's wrong in the heart. So that shows us, as the Prophet Wasallam said, that there's a relationship between the heart and our actions. All of that it comprises Iman. The person who does no outward good deeds, that shows there's a nux in their heart. If they're not trying to practice the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, the obligatory actions. The Prophet Wasallam ordered us to have the beard as men. He ordered us. It's not because we, uh, it's a fashion trend, hopefully, for, you know, that we, we grow this ta'ala because the Prophet ﷺ grew it and ordered us to grow it. Otherwise, many of us would have the, the nice goatee and it would be, look like this and it would be designed and it would be, you know, all uh, fashionable. However, instead, we choose the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ because he ordered it. And so the person who shaves that, that shows that that's, that's, a, that's an action. There's some nuks in their iman. There's some deficiency in their faith. Or perhaps, perhaps it could be due to ignorance. That they think that the beard is not an obligation. They say, oh, it's just a sunnah. Still that shows that their iman is not on camel because everyone knows that the Prophet wore a beard and that this is a good thing. I don't think any Muslims believe that the beard is actually uh, something which is not from Islam or not related to Islam, not related to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, perhaps they may believe that it is not, that it is quote-unquote sunnah, meaning that it is not an obligation, that it is something extra. This is what many people have the misconception of, but the Prophet Sallallahu ordered us in many statements. So the person who knows this ruling, but then they choose to shave, shave their beard and be baby face then 
this person is illustrating their, this is an outward type of sin. This is something, they're showing sinfulness outwardly. And it shows what? It shows a deficiency in the heart. That there's, you know, some things. Maybe they feel they'll be ridiculed. Whatever the situation that caused them, or they feel that they're more handsome without the beard, whatever the situation is, that is a deficiency in their iman. That shows a weakness in their iman. And we ask Allah to protect us from weak iman. And may Allah strengthen us all in our iman. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala said, It is not permissible that a believing man would sound faith in his heart. Uh, it is not possible that a believing man with sound faith in his heart that Allah has made it obligatory upon him prayer, alms, fasting, and hajj uh, live his entire life without prostrating a single prostration nor fasting a single Ramadan nor paying alms nor making hajj to his house this is not possible and it can only come from one with hypocrisy and apostasy in his heart not from a person with correct iman that's a beautiful Beautiful statement of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah Ta'ala Shaykh uh, Abdulaziz mentions That it is not permissible to judge an individual By saying he or she Has never performed an action of worship outwardly Also he mentions that Those who use the ahadith That give examples of individuals Who never perform good deeds Being taken out of the hellfire Have misunderstood those ahadith As is the case with the man Who killed 100 people Then made hijrah as this is a righteous deed that removes sins. Also, when analyzing these texts, it is important to realize that some of the examples are referring to previous nations whose Sharia rulings were not, not exactly the same as that of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam's Sharia. And then, going to the final part of the treaties where Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah ta'ala said, There is no difference between any of those infractions, regardless of whether they were committed jokingly or intentionally or out of fear. They all constitute disbelief unless done under compulsion. And then he said, We seek refuge with Allah from those things that cause his wrath and punishment. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon the best of his creation, Muhammad ibn Abdullah and his family and companions. So all of the above sins are acts that all of the ten nawaqid that we mentioned are acts that expel one outside of the fold of Islam. And the only excuse for someone deliberately committing one of those acts or statements of disbelief is under compulsion. Whoever commits an action of disbelief under compulsion and his heart is filled with faith, then this individual has not disbelieved. That's a statement of Shaykh Abdulaziz Rajihi. The evidence for this is the statement of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala Whoever disbelieved in Allah after his belief Except him who is forced thereunto And whose heart is at rest with uh, faith But such as open their breast to disbelief On them is wrath from Allah And theirs will be a great torment Therefore whoever disbelieves due to wealth Or for wealth Or his family uh, or his family prefers this life over the next and makes this worldly life more valuable than the next life and prefers this life over his religion then this person has disbelieved force can be defined as someone being compelled this necessitates someone placing a sword to his throat or threatening to kill him and he knows for sure that this person will kill him if he does not utter disbelief then this is compulsion and that is a statement of uh, Sheikh Abdulaziz uh, uh, Raji. Therefore, it is not simply based upon just a general fear or the loss of wealth and or, and or family. But instead, compulsion is when someone threatens to kill a person and the individual threatened has no doubt that they will be killed or that they have a weapon turned against them with the overwhelming possibility that it will be used to kill them. Then this is excused according to the Quran and the Sunnah and the consensus of the scholars. Before we end, I wanted to mention some various uh, some various benefits from the ulama, and I think we'll save that to the next sitting. We'll just make it a very brief sitting, since this has kind of been long. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.